I'm Jennifer Langer, and I'm one of your hosts um, for our broadcast today. Also joining me as co-hosts are my colleagues, Aaron Gates and Erica Delamar. Um, we all work for California State Parks in the Interpretation and Education Division, and more specifically for uh, the Ports Program. Aaron and I are Ports Program Coordinators. Hello, everybody. And Erica Delamar is our MPA Outreach and Education Coordinator. So again, we will be your hosts um, for today's program. The PORTS program, as I had mentioned, is an acronym that stands for Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students. And it's a premier distance learning program that connects K-12 students from all over the world to California State Parks. And it's a free program. So if you're interested in learning more about it, please visit PORTS, P-O-R-T-S, dash ca dot us and uh, sign up for one of our programs today it's pretty awesome so in all of our infinite expertise in digital engagement um, we have assembled a team of um, state park ports interpreters from all across the state wave everybody <laughs> uh, to join us for this live virtual King Tides event today um, and, and to give you a view of what King Tides look like from all of their respective parks. This King Tides event is a really special collaborative um, effort with the California Coastal Commission and many other agencies and organizations um, to raise awareness about sea level rise through the lens of these naturally occurring high tides, which are happening right now as we speak. In just a moment, um, our co-host, Erica Delmar, the MPA Outreach and Education Coordinator, is going to share some science uh, behind these extremely high and extremely low um, water occurrences that happen only once or twice a year. Um, so it's going to be pretty exciting to take a little peek into the science behind it so that you all understand what king tides are and why they're here. However, before we learn about the King Tides, um, I'm really excited to announce that we have some really special high-level guests that are joining our uh, event today. And I, I just wanna give a shout out to a few of these special guests. So we're gonna have from um, California Natural Resources, Secretary Wade Crowfoot is gonna be joining us later in the event this morning. Um, we also have from California State Parks, our director, Armando Quintero, who's gonna be joining us live from China Camp State Park. So there's another park that's gonna be live with us as well today. So this is just incredible. And last but not least, I'm really super excited to uh, announce that we have someone from the California Coastal Commission, Annie Frankel is joining us today um, to share some information about the community science project that you can all participate in. The public is welcome and, and encouraged to actually participate in this um, project. It's called Snap the Shore, See the Future. And Annie's gonna tell you all about it um, a little later in our event. So what I'd like to do now is turn things over to my co-host, Erica, who's gonna, again, give you a little bit of science behind of what King Tides are and why they're here today. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction, Jen. Um, my name is Erica Delamar. I am the Marine Protected Area Outreach and Education Project Coordinator for California State Parks, and I am so excited for our program today. But like Jen said, before we get started, we need to cover just a couple of basic things to understand the science of tides. So we're gonna answer a couple questions. Number one, what are tides? Number two, what make king tides special and stand apart? And number three, why are king tides important to pay attention to? So number one, what are tides? Well, the word tide is the term we use to describe the alternating rise and fall of the sea level in relation to land. This movement occurs in the ocean and sometimes in large lakes, and it's driven by the gravitational pull of the moon and our sun. Throughout the month and the year, positions of the sun and the moon, they change relative to Earth, so our tides fluctuate as well. Additional factors such as the local shape of your coastline, the local depth of the water, even the local depth and shape of the sea floor can determine the tides that you have in your area. So most coastal areas experience generally two high tides and two low tides every day with a couple of exceptions. But today we're going to be focusing on king tides. So that's the tide that gets to wear the big crown, right? They are really special. And so what is a king tide? Let's go ahead and have a look at this diagram. Jen, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing that and putting that up on screen. Very good. 
There it is. All right. So king tides generally occur once or twice every year when the orbits and the alignment of the earth, the moon, and the sun all line up to combine to produce the greatest tidal effects of the year. So we get the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. Today is a new moon. So the moon is in direct alignment with the earth and the sun. And our ocean is experiencing the strong combined gravitational pull from both of those bodies in one direction. Additionally, right now, this part of the year, the moon is closer to planet Earth than it is during other parts of the year. So it's pulling on the, on the Earth's ocean even more. The gravitational pull is stronger. So king tides appear along the shorelines and what they look like is really high water levels. And that's what we're gonna get to see a little bit of today. Thanks, Jen, that's cool on that diagram if you wanna uh, take that slide off. Okay, so you might be wondering why we're so excited to be sharing these king tides with you. Well, the cool thing about King Tides is that they give you a glimpse into our future. So I guess we're kind of going to be doing a little bit of time travel today, which is really exciting to think about. So our global ocean, it covers about 70% of our planet. That's a lot of water. And unfortunately, climate change is already having a very real impact on it. When we burn fossil fuels for energy, we add more and more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. This buildup of greenhouse gases, it acts like a warm blanket. It keeps our Earth really, really warm, but a little bit warmer than our planet actually needs. These rising temperatures, of course, are causing things like glaciers and sea ice to melt at a little bit of a faster rate. And that meltwater, it eventually flows into the ocean and becomes part of our one big global ocean. Additionally, and this is a thing a lot of people don't know about. Are you ready for a cool fact? The ocean absorbs a lot of heat out of our atmosphere. When water warms up, do you remember what it does? It expands or it increases in volume. So when you combine the addition of meltwater to a warming ocean, you get observable rising sea levels along the coastlines around the world. Over time, sea level rise is raising the height of our daily tides. So as a result, high tides are reaching higher and they're extending further into land. As time goes by, the water level reached now during a king tide will eventually be the water level reached during an average day-to-day -day tide. So essentially, king tides preview how sea level rise will affect coastal areas in the future. So think about that. Sea level rise will make today's king tide, what you guys are gonna see today, become the future's everyday tides. So why is it important to be paying attention to this? Why are we even doing this program? Well, low-lying shoreline development, like our cities and our towns and our roads, they're all at increased risk of flooding because sea level rise and you know our public, our governments are investing in building that infrastructure along the shoreline, but the ocean is starting to rise. When we host this annual King Tide event from the shorelines of different California coast state parks, we can really help you guys get a better understanding of what the potential of sea level rise, the impacts that we might be experiencing along different parts of the California coast. With an increased understanding and understanding the science behind it and how sea level rise is gonna impact local resources and it's valuable information for you, for your community and for your community leaders. So now that we know what tides are, what king tides are, let's go ahead and get wise to sea level rise. We're going to shoot it straight over to our very first location in San Diego, we are going to say hello to Sandy, who is at San Alejo State Beach in San Diego County. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Erica. Hey, Sandy, before we hop over to you, and Erica, thank you again so much for the science behind it, because I think it is important for us to have that perspective and to, to understand that uh, king tides are naturally occurring, but we're using them as a tool, as a visualization of what future sea level rise um, will look like. So I appreciate that very much. Um, just to our viewers, I want to let you know that um, for those of you, whether you're joining us on the webinar or you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, we do have Q&A open. Um, so please feel free to leave your comments and your questions. We will try to address those throughout the program um, as organically as we can, uh, but please don't hesitate to, to, to do that and, and engage with us in this live discussion today. Also, I just wanted to make a note um, to our viewers as well, that we are adhering um, to COVID-19 um, safety guidelines and precautions in all of our parks. 
Our parks are open to the public. Um, just we, we realize that this is very important uh, for our mental and physical health that we have access to our parks. Our parks are open, but we are adhering to the guidelines with wearing our masks and, and maintaining social distance when need be. So you will notice that some of our interpreters have masks. Some don't. Those who don't are in a safe situation and, and are able to stay uh, more than six feet away from the public or, or other coworkers. Um, so I just wanted to make sure and let you know that. So again, without further ado, let's take it down to San Diego, where we're going to talk to Sandy at San Alejo State Beach. Sandy, it's all you. Oh. All right. I want to welcome everyone to our wonderful program today, Getting Wise to Sea Level Rise. I'm so excited. I'm Sandy, and I'm an interpreter here at San Alejo State Beach in San Diego County. And I hope some of you have been able to visit us at some point. We're talking about sea level rise and how it's affected all the areas along the coast. And specifically today, we're going to talk about how it's affected us here at our campground in San Alejo. And first of all, I wanna give everybody that's here a round of applause uh, and a pat on the back for being up bright and early on a Monday morning. And we're so appreciative that you're here with us. Um, I want to tell you, first of all, that we have a huge high tide right now and you're going to be able to see it. I mean, it is right up to the coast right there. And we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, yeah, it's super high. I think we're at seven feet plus down here right now. So that's really cool. Um, but I wanted to tell you, first of all, how we are being affected from these high tides. I want to show a picture. Miss Jen, can you show that picture, first of all? that shows a high tide, one of our extreme high tides and our extreme low tides. And I'm gonna show you where we shot that in just a minute, but you can see dr some dramatic differences there between high and low tides here at the campground. And then I also want you, uh, go ahead and take that off now. And I wanna show you where we took this picture. And then you can see right here, how high it is right now. I mean, it's all the way up. And uh, some brave surfers out there, which I would not suggest right now. Uh, but we're showing you again that high tide and what it's doing to the campground. And speaking of our campground, I wanna back up for a second. Since we're talking about the effects of the high tides, let's take a look at this first campground, or excuse me, campsite. So this is site 62. And I want you to notice it's beautiful, right? We've got a view of the ocean, some protection and privacy with some vegetation around and so forth. And you know you would need to bring some materials. We would need to bring materials like what? Oh my goodness. Maybe folding tables, packing some food, some kind of a protection for a tent or pop up some type of uh, cover and so forth. But what else do you need at the campsite? You need the campsite, right? So speaking of the effects of King Tides, we're gonna be moving over to our next campsite. And I want you to notice if you see any differences. So hopefully you can get a beautiful view of our high tides as we're doing this. Well, guess what? You're standing right at the next campsite, number 63. And guess what? Sandy, that looks like the ocean right behind you. There was a campsite. There is no campsite here. And that's one of the things you have to have when you come camping. So that is a dramatic way to take a look at a king tide, right? I do want to show you another picture right now. Miss Jen, put the uh, second picture up. And I know it's getting a little loud from the water right here. I'm hoping you're still hearing me. But you're going to look down and see from the back side of this campground, if we did not have high tides, we could have walked around and stood on the shore. But you're going to take a look at the picture and then come back to us. And it's showing you even the roots that are exposed from that churning and that erosion that's being caused by these king tides. Even though they're naturally occurring, these extreme king tides 
are too much for us. Even state parks, you can see these large boulders down there. State parks has been doing mitigation projects. And unfortunately, the king tides recently have been too much for this area right here. So we've lost not only 63, but we've also lost this second campsite right here, 64 as well. So what does that mean for state parks? And especially here at San Alejo, what it's gonna mean, sorry guys, gonna get you looking good. Um, what it means is we've lost, if there were only three people at 63 and 64, and they were here at least 300 days a year, it would be almost 2000 visitors that are no longer able to visit us during the year. And that's also a loss of revenue for state parks as well. That's just one effect. If we dive into the future, scientists and researchers here are very confident that as sea level continues to rise, we might have so much erosion going on that there will be an effect where the bridge and the highway that crosses the bridge would also be affected. And this gives you another chance to see the mitigation uh, efforts that state parks have done. You can see the large boulders across the way, but you can also see that relentless king tides moving up and making, whoops, sorry, moving up and making it a concern for us in the future. So I want to thank you for being with me. And I wanted to send it up to Miss Alex, 50 miles north of us up in uh, uh, Crystal Cove. Wow, uh, Alex, before you start, Sandy, thank you so much. And wow, what, what a visual representation just right behind you that the ocean looks like it's literally gonna come up over that fence. And I'm an avid camper. I'm, I'm very sad to hear that we're losing campgrounds. Um, I personally have camped where you are right now, maybe not at spot 63 and certainly not now at spot 63. <laughs> Um, so I'm sad to hear about uh, the, the potential for us to lose campgrounds as a result of sea level rise. But thank you for sharing that. And as you said, we're going to move on up the coast to Crystal Cove in Orange County. And Alex is going to share uh, what the king tides look like and how they're impacting her park in that local area. Bye, Sandy. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and good morning. My name is Alex Anderson, and I'm a Marine Protected Area Interpreter here at Crystal Cove State Park down in Southern California in Orange County. And I'm really excited to invite you down to the shoreline today um, to witness one of the most extreme tides of the year called a king tide. I'm actually gonna turn the camera around right now so you can see the tide stretching up. It was about a 7.2 at 8 a.m. So the tide is receding a little bit, but you can see those waves are almost licking the, the footsteps of these historic cottages we have in our cultural area called the Historic District here at Crystal Coast State Park. And this is the fourth year in a row that California State Parks has teamed up with the California Coastal Commission um, for the California King Tides Project. And we really use these king tides to think about the future of our coastline and how sea level rise might impact our coastline. So I think I have an image, Jen, um, from the same location, but at low tide. So you can see the difference between this extreme high tide, the king tide, and our low tides. So tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the earth, but mainly the moon. Um, and king tides occur when the sun, the moon, and the earth are in alignment. But they're very special tides because we only see them about once or twice a year. So you can see the low tide has pulled back, um, revealing all of that sand. Thank you, Jen, for that. So if we come back to our normal shot of our historic district, we want to think about sea level rise and the future of our coastline. So what is sea level rise? While our rising seas are occurring because the ocean is expanding as it takes up the heat from global warming, our earth is warming. Also, um, there's a contribution of fresh water from melting ice sheets and glaciers due to global warming. So why is our earth warming? Well, as 
we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas. Um, it creates a lot of carbon dioxide, rampant carbon dioxide that gets trapped in our atmosphere, kind of acting like a blanket, like Erica mentioned earlier. Um, and as we burn more and more fossil fuels, that blanket gets thicker and thicker, warming our waters. And so our waters are rising here in Southern California. Now, what does that mean um, for Southern California, sea, the sea level rise? Well, our beaches are actually shrinking due to coastal erosion. Coastal erosion is the wearing down or loss of sediment, soil, or sand along our coastline due to rising seas and um, and storm surges. So our beaches are here are shrinking in Southern California. And in order to demonstrate how coastal erosion works, we have a fun um, model that you can create at home or actually at the beach. And now I'm going to be safe and put on my mask because my lovely helper Laurel is here to show us how we can learn about coastal erosion and how it changes our coastline. So, or do I want to turn it around? There you go. You want to find a tray. Um, you can find a cooking tray. I'm using a plastic tray right here. You want to have some water. And then you also want to use sand. But you never want to take sand from the beach. So if you have a clay sand at home, that's fine. Or if you have soil, if you have a backyard, and you can here we have our tray. We put some animals inside because that's fun. And now we're going to add some sand. So I have a measuring cup and sand. I think we wanted to do six cups. So we're creating right now an exposed shoreline. So here's our sandy beach. Going to compact it a little bit. And now we want to add some water to our ocean here. So we're going to use our measuring cup again. And we're going to add some water. Maybe our maybe our whales and dolphins will move around in our water now. So we're filling up our ocean. And I'm already seeing some cracks in the shoreline. All right, now if you have a, a water bottle, an empty water bottle, or you can use the plank of wood, you want to press it down onto the water, creating waves. And as you create waves, I don't know if you can see, the sand is depleting on the shore and our beach is shrinking. So this is happening down here in Southern California. Um, a USGS, a USGS study um, predicts that we're going to lose about two thirds of our beaches here in Southern California within the next century. So that's definitely going to impact our coastline. Also, world, we can go back onto the. Also, coastal erosion due to sea level rise. is also going to impact our coastline. So 26.3 million people live on the coast of California, supporting a $44 billion ocean economy. And coastal erosion is definitely going to impact our um, cultural resources as well as the infrastructure of our coastal communities. So here we have the historic district, Jen. I think you have a photo maybe of the historic district um, in there. This is a collection of cottages that were built in the 1920s and 1930s, and they've been historically refurnished so that you can actually rent them out as campsites through California State Parks, which is really cool. But do you see how close they sit to the ocean on the sand? I think, Jen, I have another photo of, um, it's actually of the cottage where I am right now. This is called Cottage 13, the Beaches Cottage. If you ever saw the movie, The Beaches from the 1980s, <laughs> there was a scene shot here. But if you go to the next photo, you can see how the sand has pulled away from the cottage, revealing kind of the, the, the infrastructure and how 
we have some rebar sticking out and obviously some coastal engineers had worked on um, supporting the structure. So you can see how sea level rise and coastal erosion are definitely going to impact our coastline here in Southern California. All right. Well, I just wanna thank you guys so much for joining me down here at Crystal Cove State Park to witness one of the most extreme tides of the year. And I want you guys to also know that um, the California Coastal Commission, the California King Tides Project, Snap the Shore, See the Future is a way that you can get involved. So if you can safely take a photo of the extreme high tide, the King Tide today, um, you can go to their website and upload those photos to contribute to an interactive map so we can learn more about our King Tides and sea level rise. Thank you guys so much for visiting me here at Crystal Cove State Park. And now I think I'm sending it up to Parker in the Gaviota, Gaviota State Park. Yeah, excellent. And before we connect with Parker, Alex, thank you so much. Um, Little Cove State Park is near and dear to my heart uh, being my home park for 10 years. So I love seeing it even virtually. And what a, what a great representation of what the King Tides look like from, from your park and the impacts that it's having on that park and, and the potential impacts that it will be having on the historic district that, that, that you shared with us as well. And your model was super cool and super, looks very easy to make. So I'm excited to do that with my, my six-year-old here. Yay. Thank you for sharing that, Alex, that was great. And like Alex said, we're gonna go ahead and move um, further all up the coast and we're gonna connect with Parker who's at Gaviota State Park. So Parker, you are in the limelight now, go ahead. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Parker and I am coming to all of you from Gaviota State Park. You know, it's one of my favorite state parks here in California and oh, it is a beautiful day along our coastline, don't you think? And well, glimpse of our tides come in. And this morning, our high tide is about 6.8 feet, and it actually made it up just right beyond, like, right, let's see, it was right about here where I'm at right now this morning. So it was in pretty far. And well, let me share with you a little bit about what we're looking at here today. We, we have our Gaviota Pier over here, and then we're, we're on our beach. We're actually on the far edge of our beach. Our, entire beach has actually been covered up with water this morning all the way down it's pretty incredible to think all the way down to um, this little bluff here normally when the tide's out low tide we can walk for miles along this coastline which is pretty incredible but um you know all of this high coming in it's actually this morning it's made its way up into um our parking lot here at gaviota state park um, which is actually right in front of me here. If I can turn my camera around, you'll actually see um, a little glimpse of it. We're completely even. So our a beach is even with our parking lot, which is even with our campground, which is at the other end and our restrooms and our store. Uh, we're really in one of those low lying areas here at Gaviota State Park where we do see a lot of flooding, a lot of coastal flooding um, that happens here. We also do see a lot of erosion too that occurs here um, due to these high tide events. You know, and well, that's something that we all must think about too. We have our pier here. And while you can actually see, we have these really large boulders here that's to help prevent erosion. And if we think about sea level rise too, well, you know, the access to get up here is actually just right over here. And you can see how much this water is coming in that potentially in the future, our access to places like this could really well be impaired. And well, Jen, I believe I do have a few pictures to share as well with our friends today about some of the other things that we're seeing along our coastline. Well, here at Gaviota State Park, some other things to think about along our coastline too is about how flooding impacts us. And so we do see a lot of flooding here, as I mentioned. This is from our um, creek. We have a Gaviota Creek and down the way we have another creek, El Capitan Creek. You can actually see these debris flows that are coming in here. And well, if you think about too with climate change and sea level rise, we're also seeing uh, more severe droughts that are occurring. We're also seeing um, more frequent and more severe wildfires that are occurring. We've had a lot in this area as well. 
And well, in the winter times, we also have increased floods that are occurring that are leading to things like this. And then you mix in the king tides and these high tide events, and this is what you're getting here. And I, I have a few other pictures too, Then We can just look at those too while we're here. And you can see here, this is along the beach. I want you to take a look at this image, see what you notice about it. Well, you can see after this flooding event here, if you look in the corner, you can actually see there's some, some vehicles that ended up. They came from the other side of the highway and they came onto our shore. So that's something that we must be aware about is this is what can happen when we mix sea level rise, when we mix wildfires and flooding with droughts. This is something that we could very well see more of. And well, here along the coast, I believe my last picture here is um, about, oh, we could do this one, yeah. Well, down at um, Refugio State Beach, which is about 10 miles to the east of here, we actually see um, a lot of erosion that's occurring. I, I really like this picture here because it really illustrates what's going on. We have these really ginormous um, palm trees, and palm trees were planted in the late 1920s. And you can really see what's happening here with our coastal erosion. So when these tides come in, they come all the way up to these trees and they're just eroding away. And unfortunately, a lot of these trees are now falling down and being taken out to sea. So this is just one of the many uh, sources of examples that we have um, seen here. Um, and then our final picture actually shares with us what it looks like lower. So we're at a high tide and well, actually this is taken down the coast here. This is about a quarter mile here. If I were to walk a quarter mile today, well, I actually couldn't really do that because the tide's coming in so far. But normally at a low tide event, like a zero tide, which this is at here, um, we could walk for miles along this coastline. So it's pretty incredible when we really think about um, how these king tides are really restricting coastal access for us in our area and leading to um, erosion and when we mix them with other events that are occurring as well. Well, with that, I hope you all enjoyed exploring Gaviota State Park with me today and seeing a little bit about what we have going on here, with our king tides. Uh, Parker, I just have to chime in and say those images of vehicles on your beach, that's just mind blowing. And, and if a picture was worth a thousand words, <laughs> that picture certainly says a lot. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining our lineup today to give a perspective of King Tides and future sea level rise from the viewpoint of Gaviota State Park. Parker, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Um, for as we move up the coast, um, we're actually going to turn host control over to Erica, who's going to introduce um, some of our parks that are that are in Central California. So, Erica, I'm going to turn host control over to you now. All right, awesome, Jen. Well, I did want to start out before we go any further and um, thank participants who are sharing their questions with us in the Q and A on the webinar. I've been uh, typing away and sharing some answers. So if you've got questions about anything that is uh, being shared during our different drop-ins at the di different state parks, let us know in the Q&A. Um, we're also monitoring some of the questions on Facebook too. So we'll do our best to get to your questions throughout the program. So our first stop on the Central Coast, uh, we're moving north again, and we are heading to Hearst San Simeon State Park. And we are going to be saying hello to our colleagues Robin and Monica. Good morning. Good morning, Erica. Hello. Hello. We're so Thank excited you. to be here. Hi. My name is Monica. Hi, I'm Robin. We both are in the San Luis Obispo Coast, which is smack dab in the middle of California, about three hours north of Los Angeles and three hours south of San Francisco. And right now we're standing at Hearst San Simeon State Park. So here at Hearst San Simeon State Park, we've got a lot of noise going on. There's some 15 to 20 foot waves. We've got some elephant seals fighting in the background. So hopefully you guys can hear us okay. Um, but I also wanna uh, let everyone know that it's MPA Monday. So happy MPA Monday. MPA stands for Marine Protected Area. Um, and these are essentially just like underwater parks. And right now we're looking at the Piedras Blancas MPA. Um, I've got a couple pictures that I just took yesterday. Jen, if you don't mind sharing those pictures. This is what yesterday 
was like here on this coast. And what you'll be looking at is a negative 1.4 uh, foot tide. So this is a pretty low tide. And when I show you what we're actually looking at right now, it will be quite a change. So you can see we've got some elephant seals out here. We've even got some uh, males fighting in the distance that you can see. And I'm gonna go ahead and flip the camera so you guys can see what I'm seeing. So you're actually catching us at the perfect time. We are at our highest tide right now at 9.05. This is an almost seven foot tide. And you can see that there are several elephant seals out on the beach right now. Uh, so king tides, like it's already been mentioned, are uh, what happen only a couple times a year. They're naturally occurring, they're predictable and expected, and they're not an everyday occurrence. Um, king tides of today, are the normal high tides of tomorrow. And that's really important to remember because just imagine what that holds for future king tides. Um, it's gonna be pretty insane. And for us here, that has a lot to do with the elephant seals. So you can see that this is where they are right now and their habitat is shrinking. Um, and it's, it's been continually shrinking. Actually behind me is another stretch of beach that is no longer a beach and all of the elephant seals have moved to this location here. Um, just for safety. They're getting tossed around. These are pretty strong animals. So to see them getting tossed in the waves is something that I've never really uh, seen before. But we have Monica here to give you a little bit more about uh, what's going to happen to these elephant seals. Awesome. And I'll go ahead and show you that little stretch of beach that Robin mentioned. It's right here behind me. And you can see the waves are basically right up to the bluff here. Normally, uh, on a normal tide day, we'll have elephant seals on this side of the beach as well, but they have all headed uh, to the little southern end of our beach here uh, to stay back from these waves. So a little bit about elephant seals and why they are here. They're a type of marine mammal that spend most of their time in the ocean, but they do have to come to the beach a few times a year uh, to do a few things that they can't do in the ocean. And right now is an especially important time of year for these uh, animals as winter time is their breeding season, their mating season, nursing season. There's so much happening uh, right now. And each day we'll see more and more elephant seals arrive on the beach as uh, they come here to rest and mate and breed. We have a lot of them here right now. You might even hear some male elephant seal noises in the background as they have a showdown. We can see some, a couple out there who might be sprawling and we had a couple of big guys who were doing it right as uh, on the shoreline just a few minutes ago. Uh, but what king tides uh, do to these animals is it really uh, reduces the amount of space that they're able to take up on the beach. And uh, there are a lot of seals here right now, but as we get into the next few weeks, we'll see more and more seals, almost to a point where there's hardly any space for them to move around. So having these king tides causes them to push back a little bit further. There's less space for them to be. And it'll be uh, especially crazy in uh, the next round of king tides in January when we will have a lot of newborn pups. Uh, the crazy thing about pups is that they actually are born uh, with, uh, without the ability to swim. So if these king tides are coming up on the shore, their mothers aren't able to protect them, uh, those pups could get washed up by the waves and can't really do much about it. They uh, don't know how to swim at that point in their lives. So uh, that's a big cause of their high mortality rate. But uh, we will have to see how that goes next month. And I'm actually just gonna flip this camera out towards the ocean right now. So you can see just how big these waves are. Robin mentioned we might have a 15 foot waves today and it is absolutely crazy. We are up on a, on a bluff right here. Every once in a while, we'll have a splash of water come up from right here. So uh, that is just about how these king tides affect our elephant seal friends. 
we'll see how it goes in uh, January where we have our second round of King Tides with the pups. Or third round, excuse me. Third round of King Tides with our pups. And uh, we have a photo, Jen, if you'd like to share it, of what a pup looks like, just so you can get a little bit better idea. Should be the next one after that. Awesome. So this one was taken last year. Here we have a handful of mother or mother elephant seals with their pups. This one in the center here has three with her, which likely means that uh, some of those pups were either left by their mothers or got lost by their mothers. Uh, one, there is only one pup born to each mother. So they have a lot to handle with just one pup and trying to block them from waves. So we'll have to see how that goes. Thank you. Here's our uh, final. Uh, there we go. Thanks for joining us here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robin and Monica. That was really great to see, especially see those elephant seals so close up. That's a really important thing to know about sea level rise is that there are a lot of areas where wildlife like those beautiful elephant seals or different types of bird species, even species of plants and invertebrates. When the sea levels rise, if they have a built up environment, say a big seawall or a highway, or there's something in the way, it doesn't leave a lot of room for them to move inland and find more dry land. So really awesome to see those elephant seals. Thank you guys so much. We're going to continue on. See you later. <laughs> we'll continue on. We're going to head further up the coastline and we're actually going to get into my neck of the woods. I'm based here in Monterey, California, and I've got my colleague and friend with me, Daniel at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve is calling in and we are so excited to see you this morning. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Erica. Thank you. And thank you, Robin and Monica and all the parks before as we travel up to the coast on this very special day. My name is Daniel and I'm a California State Park interpreter here at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. And I wanna welcome you to our King event here. As uh, Monica and Robin were saying, there's big wave events happening today too. So our surf is quite large here at Point Lobos and our high tide just hit at about 9.06. So just a few minutes ago, it was approaching seven feet. And let's just flip the camera and look down at our parking lot here at Whaler's Cove at Point Lobos. We have this kind of riprap rock right here built as a wall to protect us from these big uh, wave events as well as high tides. And then our boat ramp right there, we'll see some water coming up into our parking lot. And we'll go ahead and take a walk down the trail and learn a little bit more about these king tides and how they are, you know, can be a, a, a glimpse into our future. As Robin said, our king tides today are our high tides tomorrow. But let's just take a, a look at the whole picture here, everyone. Point Lobos is one of the most special parks in a group of 280 special parks. So. We all have something really wonderful. And Point Lobos has this incredible forest on land. We're a state natural reserve, as Erica said. But we're also a state marine reserve and a marine protected area. And as Robin had said earlier, it's, uh, it's MPA Monday. So you hoo, all right. King tides and MPA Mondays, big waves, what a day. And as we scan the scene here, looking over the Pacific Ocean, just beneath the surface is a kelp forest full of life. Many animals depend upon that forest of the ocean, including the sea otter, as well as many fish, invertebrates, and other plant life. So today in our moments together, we're going to learn a little bit more about this kelp forest that's here, and a little bit more about sea level rise, climate change, and king tides. So come along. Let's take a look right on over here. Want to uh, put ourselves over here to get a better look of these king tides. So let's go along. Oh, wait a minute. 
Oh, let's put down our camera right here. I just found something right down here. Maybe you'll be able to see it as well. This bottle covered in, in giant kelp. Now, this obviously doesn't belong here, but let's take a look at what's inside of this bottle here. It, surrounded, you know, wrapped in this giant kelp right here. Hmm. All right. Wow. Oh, well, it's kind of long. Oh, first thing it says is, please read the whole message. All right, now that I have you here, we'll share this information together. We'll find out what is in this bottle right here. It starts out, thank you for finding me. Now our story can be told. The story of giant kelp. Well, no one knows for sure, but some say our marine floral family dates back at least 10,000 years ago. During this time, we have thrived in cold ocean temperatures that we need to grow and to feed diverse animal species, including you not to mention the many other animal species that we shelter. We also protect the coastline as we reduce coastal erosion, serving as a buffer, slowing down storm-driven waves to minimize erosion and damage. We store carbon, we produce oxygen. We are giant kelp, but we have noticed lately many changes. There are warmer temperatures due to climate change. And if the ocean warms up too much, we stop growing. And everything we do will change or end. Today's king tides can give you a glimpse into the future if things continue as they are. Please remember this as you move forward. Signed, Giant Kelp. Wow, who knew that this forest right beneath the surface of the ocean houses and protects many, many animals, gives us food, oxygen, stores carbon, and also protects our coastline as the kelp slows down these storm-driven waves that cause erosion and tear our houses and our buildings away from the coastline. Giant kelp, and it sounds like it needs cold water in order to survive and to support the land or support the, the species that it does. Wow, let's think about that as we walk to our next stop and check out the king tides. All right, we're gonna plant our camera right here to get a look at as the tides come up up the boat ramp right there into our parking lot. You can see it's starting to come up a bit right there. Now, Monica and Robin were talking about the elephant seals being kind of pushed out or cut off. Well, that's what's gonna happen here is that our, not our elephant seals, but our visitors, our parking lot will be cut off. And so we're gonna need to figure out a solution for this. Now there's a couple of things that that letter from Giant Kelp mentioned. It mentioned climate change and, and sea level rise. Let's just take a moment to, to explain that. Now, climate change is something that we're seeing evidence of throughout our planet. And what we need to know about is the amount of carbon dioxide that is being admitted into our atmosphere and into our oceans. Carbon dioxide is a regular and natural part of life on Earth. But when we burn fossil fuels like coal, gas, or oil, we're adding more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. We call this rampant carbon dioxide. It builds up, warms our planet, and kind of surrounds it, and, and keeps it warm much like a blanket and traps that heat in. With these warming temperatures, we have polar ice caps that are melting, and they are adding water into our oceans, also causing temperatures to warm as well, and causing our tides 
uh, are causing our sea level to rise. And here with our king tides, we get a, a glimpse into how high they may be. Now, these warmer temperatures aren't good for the kelp forest either. They need cold ocean temperatures. And if the temperature warms up too much, the giant kelp won't be able to survive and won't be able to support the life that it does. So we look at these king tides as a glimpse into the future. And when we take note of these tides and document them, they can help us make informed decisions about what our next steps should be. So on that end, we've talked about it a little bit on our program here, is the program by the California Coastal Commission, where we snap the shore and see the future. People all over the state are safely putting them themselves in places where they can snap the king tides and then upload it to the California Commission's website uh, uh, for the California King Tides Project and put their photo on there to help document this. This documentation can help us make, like I said, more informed decisions about how we are going to deal with uh, sea level rise in certain areas. My colleague Erica mentioned managed retreat, taking a look at our infrastructures and, and, and looking at them as we avert risk. Our risk here is sea level rise. So we're gonna need to you know, do a managed retreat out of this area. And perhaps this will be closed off and a parking area will be somewhere else in the, in the reserve to let this go back into its natural cycles. Now everybody, humans are really good at solving problems. There's a lot of different solutions that we are gonna face here as we face uh, climate change and sea level rise. One thing that I uh, ask that you do is why we act individually, we also work together to approach it with a community-wide perspective, a statewide, a federal-wide, a global-wide perspective. When we start to switch from being dependent upon fossil fuels, which when we burn, um, puts an extra a rampant CO2 into our atmosphere, we wanna reverse that trend, have green, clean, renewable energy, and know that it's up to us, up to you and me to protect these resources for the people who came before us, for everything right now, and for our future. What's brought to mind is you know, never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has Margaret Mead. So with that, let's go ahead and take another look. And imagine that our daily high tides will cut off our parking lot. I ask that you give this some thought and then talk about it. Share your ideas, share your stories with each other. The more we talk about climate change and sea level rise and the things that we can do about it, the brighter the future will be. So with that, everyone, my name is Daniel. I'm a California State Park interpreter. And I thank you so much for tuning into our King Tides event today. And I know that we're gonna travel about 40 miles or 45 miles up the coast to Seacliff State Beach. Awesome, Daniel. Thank you so much. It's always great to have a visit to Whalers Cove at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve and really amazing to see those waves washing straight into the parking lot there. They're coming right up the boat ramp. They might take your kayak away if you're not careful. You might have to move your kayak shed in the future, right? It's part of that. Plan. I know. And it has. Oh, Erica, you're right. It's gone underneath. It's gone actually into the kayak shack. Oh yeah, my gosh. So, yes. <laughs> Wow. wow. Well, I think you're you're gonna have to start looking for some new real estate for your kayak shed. Daniel. Yeah, I think you're right. That's part of our managed retreat, you know, uh, solution. Absolutely. Well, hey, um, Daniel, we do have a couple questions that I wanted to ask. Um, yes. Actually, they're coming in from both Facebook and also on our Q and A and the webinar. But before I ask you those questions, if anyone is just tuning in, I wanted to welcome you to our King Tides event. We are getting wise to sea level rise with California State Parks. We are cruising up the California coastline and we are on the central coast near Monterey, California right now. There with Daniel at Point Lobos. 
Now we've got one cool question that came in from a, a brother and sister pair. We've got a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old and they asked a couple questions, but they were wondering if you can recap, how does the moon control the tide? Can you share All an right. answer with us on that one? I sure can. It has to do with kind of this gravitational dance up in the sky between the moon, the sun, and the earth. And the moon is actually quite closer to the, uh, to the earth. So it has a stronger gravitational pull uh, on the earth. So the moon actually affects our, our tides and our gravity more than the sun. But the sun's so big and close enough that it, it, it pulls as well. So it's kind of like this. I pull and repel each time. That's kind of what's going on here. And the moon being so close has a stronger pull on us. Awesome, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, and today, because it's a new moon, we have the moon lined up directly between the earth and the sun. So it's both the sun and the moon pulling the ocean in the same direction, making those big king tides. Exactly. Cool, Daniel, thank so, you. <laughs> it, was, it was so great to check in with you. Thank you so much for letting us drop in at Point Lobos. We're gonna head on up the coast now. We are headed to Seacliff State Beach uh, outside of Santa Cruz. And we're gonna say hello to our colleague, Sam. Sam, are you there with us? I am, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, Sam. Great. Hi, My name's Sam Roberts. I'm a state interpreter here at Seacliff State Beach in Santa Cruz. Let me tell you all something. I'm so excited to be here today. I drink two whole thermoses of coffee. That's just how excited I was. And I have a lot of energy today to tell you all about amazing king tides here at Seacliff, which you can see in back of me. However, there's a twist on this. We're gonna be talking about the future beach recreation from the future. And you might be asking yourself, how are you coming from the, to us from the future and why? Well, here's the thing. I'm coming to you from the future through the power of imagination, but I'm coming to you, I'm talking to you from the future because the tides, the high tides you see in back of us from the King Tides today, this may very well be what Seacliff looks like in the next 50 to 100 years. As you've heard before numerous times today, King Tides do help us visualize what rising sea levels and tides look like in the future, what they'll look like in the future. So just to get an understanding, I know probably if uh, many of you who are watching this live stream today might not have ever been here to Seacliff before. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like really quick. We have the cement ship, the pier, and just a few moments ago, we had water all the way up right here to this seawall right here. And we have the sea cliffs over here, as you can see, and some more cliffs with some houses up there. And then down there, we have our camping area, our beachside camping area, which is actually closed today because of these tides. So if you haven't been here before, now that you've seen what the beach looks like today, why don't we bring up a picture from 2020 that shows the tides, a normal low tide at Seacliff. So right here, yeah, if we go back one, you can see that's a normal low tide. It's a definitely a lot different from how it looks today, right? Yeah. So, you know, I've, as the years have passed and the earth has gotten warmer, the sea levels have risen. Um, and let's kind of watch the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has a really neat tool on their website. Um, and I took a screen capture of basically what their projected sea level rise, uh, they project the sea level rise and its impact on the beach. So let's take a short look at that. So you can see right now we're at one foot going up to two. And as we go on up, you'll start to notice if you look at the bottom right, the blue water, the light blue, that's flooding the beach. And eventually at around six feet, the entire beach is flooded and then you'll see residential areas start to get flooded around seven, eight to 10 feet. Now, right now, as I said, it's 6.4 feet right now. So nearly all the beach is covered. It has gone down a little bit, but today nearly all the beach has been covered by these tides. And NOAA actually predicts um, with a future rise in sea level, the rate at which high tide flooding will occur will undergo an accelerated increase. 
daily flooding will occur in San Francisco if a one meter global mean sea level rise occurs by 2100. And if the global mean sea level rises at the current rate of three millimeters per year, San Francisco will experience 30 days of high tide flooding by 2100. Now, uh, it's important to note that this flooding isn't going to be uniform across the state of California. If you do have this um, three millimeter per year rise or one meter rise in sea level, it's not going to be the same on every single beach. It's going to act a bit differently for each beach. But since San Francisco is in California and it's close to Santa Cruz, I figured that was a good example to use. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about the future beach recreation, right? Many of you might be wondering, well, how is this rise in sea level going to affect me, right? We've talked about a lot of things about kelp, about elephant seals and how tides affect the environment and ecosystem around you, but how is this going to affect your stay at the beach? I was wondering that myself. So I did a bit of research and here's what I found. You know, there's a lot of unique features. As I mentioned, we have the cement ship, a historical artifact right over here to my right. We have the sea cliffs, we have the beachside camping. Those really help to make sea cliffs unique. And each, each month we get thousands of visitors here. Now, a rise in sea level is going to uh, not only make the beaches narrower, but it's also going to threaten the historical artifacts we have and um, the recreation activities we have, such as beachside camping. And this has happened before. If we can uh, bring up the pictures of 1983, the campgrounds, there's actually been flooding that has happened here at Seacliff before due to a rise in tides. Um, and it's caused lots of damage to the campgrounds. You can see right there, the campgrounds are just totally flooded. And if we go on to the next picture, you can actually see a bit more of that damage as well. Right there, some massive waves striking the campground area. As I mentioned, we have closed the campground area today uh, because of the threat of a rising sea level. So as the sea level continues to rise and we get these high, high tides, right? Um, if you remember the video, a six foot tide, a six foot mean sea level rise meant that, um, meant that the entire beach was covered and it was right against the campground. So if we get those high tides, when we have that, when the sea level has risen to the seawall, it could very well go into the campground. Now that might mean in the future, there's only camping available during, during certain seasons, certain days, or there's no camping at all. Now we have actually seen we have actually had, we've seen the uh, threat of a higher sea level here at Seacliff before in the past. Uh, as a matter of fact, we actually used to have more seawalls right down here, right down here. And I think we have a picture of that as well. It's from around the, the 50s. And let's see if we can bring that picture up too. So right here, you can see we actually had another seawall down at the front of the beach but a rise in sea level actually covered, ended up covering that with sand, with water, and it doesn't, it's not to be found anymore, right? So it's totally covered. So the seawall in back of me that we have right here, this is our newest seawall, and you can still see it in the photo right there as well. With a rise in sea level though, with these, um, as I mentioned before, these king tides, right? They show us what the future may look like. So if the water, once the water rises, the sea level rises, and it starts to cover more and more of the beach, what ultimately may have to happen is the placement of another seawall. Now, right, so as the water encroaches in on the walkway in back of us, right over here, as it encroaches on the road, it could end up very well coming over there. And, you know, what happens, as I mentioned before, we have these cliffs in back of us, sea cliff, um, we have a lot of huge cliffs and you might be wondering, well, won't an eroding cliff allow for more sand on the beach? Won't the, that stop the beaches from getting narrower as the tide moves in, as the sea level rises? And that's a great point, right? But here's the thing. I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of residential areas right up there on the top of that cliff. I don't think they'd be very happy if the cliff was eroding and their house was right on the top of the hill, right? Um, so what ultimately will have to happen is another seawall will be, have to be put in once the tide, once the sea level rises and gets to that cliff 
there will be another wall that will have to be put in that will stop the erosion of the cliff, meaning the beach will get more narrow. So imagine it's a hot sunny day 50 years from now and you really wanna to go to the beach 50 or 100 years from now and you really wanna to go to the beach um, and you get to the beach and it's just totally packed with people. The beach has gotten a lot, will get a lot more narrow without that cliffside erosion happening without added sand to the beach. It's just going to be water moving in and taking over the beach. And as I mentioned before, we've seen the damage of a higher sea level and, and, and strong tides right over here at the cement, cement ship. In the 90s, you actually used to be able to walk on that cement ship and the pier. And now it has been damaged. You can see these waves just going through it right now. It's, been, it's damaged the pier and made it unsafe for the public to walk on. So they've been closed for about two years now. So to recap, your stay at the beach might look a bit different in the next 50 to 100 years. With a rise in sea level, it's going to not only make the beaches narrower, but it could very well damage lots of historical and cultural items at your beaches that you might have across California and at beaches around the world. Not only that, it's going to affect how you recreate, right? So camping, and um, it's really going to just affect your stay at the beach overall. So I know this might sound a bit, um, I know this might sound a bit distressing, but here's some things you can do. As we mentioned today, there's Snap the Shore, See the Future, and that's a community project by the California Coastal Commission. Also make sure this is a basic one, reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, you know, anything from just turning off lights you aren't using and unplugging electronics that you aren't charging. Um, and also another thing, the California Coastal Commission does hold monthly meetings around California. I believe those are virtual this year. So if you really care, if you're really passionate about um, how we shape our response to the tides, make sure to attend those. And I'd like to end with, with this. While you can't change the tides, you can change our response to them. So make sure to get involved with your local community and their response to the rising sea levels. Thank you. Awesome, that was fantastic, Sam. Thank you so much for helping us both travel into the future and into the past and really understand how things have changed there at Seacliff State Beach. It was really, oh, and awesome sunglasses, by the way. Thank you so much. Well, that concludes our Central California portion. Um, thank you to Hersey and Simeon, to Point Lobos and Seacliff. I'm gonna toss it over now to my colleague, Aaron, who is one of the other ports coordinators who is up on the North Coast. And so she's gonna take it from here. Aaron, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you, Aaron. And for all of you that are just tuning in, thank you for watching with us as we explore the California coast and see the effect of king tides along our coastline. Uh, if you have just tuned in, this broadcast will be archived on the Maine California State Parks Facebook page. So you can always tune back in to see what you've missed. We've already traveled from um, all the way down in San Diego at San Alejo State, State Beach, Crystal Cove State Park. We've been up to Gaviota State Park. We've seen the effect of king tides and sea level rise on elephant seal habitat at Her San Simeon State Park. We, where else? Oh my goodness. We've been to Point Lobo State Natural Reserve. We just went to Sea Cliff. And now I'm going to be bringing you up to Sonoma Mendocino Coast District and specifically Van Dam State Beach, where we are going to get quite a visual because not only is the tide extremely high, but with a 15 to 20 foot swell, we are really able to see the effects of the high tide and a large swell um, along our coastal parks. So let's see. Uh, Nikki, are you there? Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nikki. I am here at Van Dam SMCA, which is State Marine Conservation Area and MPA. And it is extremely high tide right now. I'm going to flip the camera around so you can see the high tide, which is about a 7.3 taking over most of our beach. I have about a five by five square of where the tide is not affecting on the beach. And you can see on this beach, we have tons of logs that some are about 5,000 pounds. And some of my favorites right now over here, where is it? That one, the flat log is rolling through the surf in the shore break. And so that becomes a dangerous situation 
Um, knowing where you're at during these high king tides is so important. As the force of these waves are unrooting the logs from the sand, which get anchored up here as the south swells come in. And right now we have a powerful swell coming from the north and the west. It's at 16 foot at 16 seconds, which is creating about 25 foot waves on the outer bars. Hitting those sea stacks, hitting the sea bluffs and the cliffs, loosening up that lower, softer sediment and widening our sea arches, sea caves, and making our cliffs a little less stable, eroding them slowly. And today I am joined by a special guest who wants to let you guys know about some of the hazards and some safety tips when you visit the coast, maybe snapshot the king tides and see a glimpse into the future. And I'm gonna let him take it away, our resident lifeguard, Ian Miller. And Nikki, is this, is this the yes. same Ian that won the Medal of Valor Award last year for a heroic rescue along the Sonoma Mendocino coast? It is. Well, Ian, thank you on behalf of not just California State Parks, but the citizens of California for helping us stay safe along our coastline. And we know that with this increase in our sea level um, and potentially big swell events like today, your job becomes even uh, more risky. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Yeah, he says, thank you. I have the mic right now, but um, yeah, as I'm turning the opposite way, you should also never turn your back on the ocean. Stay aware of where you're at when you're visiting the beach, especially on the King Tides. And um, yeah, if you're not sure, ask a lifeguard know the conditions before you come to the beach is always important. As the variables change so fast here, he told you the swell peaked overnight and just with a few hours, it was a five foot swell and went to a 20 foot swell. So this can also impact our urban interface and infrastructure. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve, who's on the south end of the beach right now. And he's gonna talk about some of the hazards that we have with our urban interface on these king tides. Sending it over to you, Steve. All right. All right, everybody can hear me. Um, thank you uh, so much, Ian and Nikki. Um, we are coming to you again from uh, Van Damme State Beach, uh, State Marine Conservation Area. And yes, we have uh, had some incredible swell today. Um, I've been seeing, you know, the waves come up to like right up here, which has made me awful nervous, especially uh, I've had to make sure that I keep my eyes on the ocean. But um, one of the things that we find, uh, you know, due to sea level rise and especially something that we can illustrate when it comes to things like um, our king tides, um, high, high tides are going to get higher and higher and um, it actually can really affect our infrastructure. Now, right here we have, of course, a seawall that you might see behind me. Um, and that protects the parking lot itself. And I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can see it. Um, now, in about 2016, this seawall had to be repaired um, because 
we had ocean water uh, washing debris and and driftwood over the seawall itself, which eventually even pushed farther into um, the highway. We have Highway One coming right here. It's about it's only about 12 foot above sea level, and every once in a while, when the swells the swell actually lines up with the tides, we might actually have um, some huge surf washing over our highway, um, which greatly impacts our uh, ability to distribute anything here. So um, high seas, high tides can really make a huge impact on our infrastructure. As well, much of our coastline in Northern California is rugged and uh, built up of you know, sandstone, which can constantly be cut away and um, erode. Now I have some uh, pictures that uh, we can pull up of the flooding event in 2016. Oh, now that is actually, oh, there we go. <laughs> So here we do. Uh, now, this was not even the worst of that uh, flooding event uh, during the King Tides. Um, we eventually had large logs moved in there, had to be moved with an excavator. Um, but this seawall was originally built in 1960. And let's take a look at that seawall, the creation of that seawall. Let's flip slides. And look at so. In order to build this, and we have to protect our uh, parking lot and even farther our highway, they had to trench deeply into the sand and make this concrete wall about uh, a four four foot high, which has now been uh, buried and inundated with sand, uh, trenching four feet deep into the into the sand, and it only comes up about you know three three or four feet above the sand level at the uh, higher point. In moist points, it's actually only a foot. So of course, when we have high tide events, this will actually be defeated. Um, but erosion can affect many structures, um, the distribution of goods along our highways. And um, I have another photo that was taken from uh, McCarricker State Park, where our historical Hall Road was actually defeated by a, or you know, eroded away a section of it. Um, this was uh, back a lot farther, I think in 2007 or so. Sections of it has, have washed away um, because of these high tide events. And the, the crashing of waves undercutting the bluff sides or our sandstone can actually, um, you know, really take an impact on historical structures like this here, our historical haul road, which uh, was utilized in order to haul lumber um, from all, all the way up in 10 Mile Beach, all the way down to the mill in Fort Bragg, California. Um, but just to make sure that everybody understands, well, we should be doing our part to, to prevent climate change from happening in the first place. Um, we also, you know, and that can be uh, by investing in green energy um, and, uh, and, you know, finding better solutions other than burning fossil fuels um, to create electricity as well, transportation and other things. Well, along with those, we have to actually try to mitigate the effects of climate change, that of like building up seawalls, like the one here that had, been, had to be rebuilt in uh, 2016, had to be rebuilt in order to protect our uh, highway, in order to protect our parking lot. But if this does not happen, you know, we have, uh, we have a rough road ahead of us. We may have to even uh, raise up the level of the highway itself. Lots of this can cost lots of money. Um, so prevention, protection, and uh, adaptations like, uh, we all have to do our part. So with that, um, we're going to pass it on up to, I believe, uh, our Coastal Commission person. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Steve. And thank you, Nikki, from Van Damme State Beach. 
And next, we are going to have the opportunity to speak with somebody with the California Coastal Commission and to highlight the King Tides project. So Annie, are you there? Hi, I'm here, thank you. So my name is Annie Kohut Frankel and I work for the California Coastal Commission. So far this morning, we've seen some amazing state parks and we've learned a lot about our beautiful California coast, including the people, animals, and plants that depend on it. We've also learned about the impacts of future sea level rise. Now I'm going to tell you about the California King Tides Project, which is a community science project that anyone can help with. So I'm going to uh, share some images with you now. Okay, so the California King Tides project is part of an international effort asking people to safely photograph the shoreline during the highest tides of the year. Photographing the impact of these tides on beaches, wetlands, cultural sites, roads, and other coastal infrastructure helps California plan for future sea level rise. There is one more day of December King Tides tomorrow throughout all of California, and Central and Northern California will see two more days of King Tides on January 11th and 12th. As you heard from the park interpreters, sea level rise is caused because our planet is heating up and our climate is changing. When we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, we release rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. That acts like a heat trapping blanket around the earth. We need that blanket because it keeps this planet warm enough for us to live here. But as we burn more and more fossil fuels, we're thickening that blanket, heating up our air, land, and water. Some of the sea level rise that we're seeing is because when water gets warmer, it takes up more space. Another reason is that as our planet warms, glaciers and ice sheets are melting into the ocean, adding more water and raising the sea level. The amount of sea level rise we ultimately see will depend on how fast we stop burning fossil fuels. King tides are naturally the highest tides of the year. They don't actually have anything to do with climate change themselves. However, they're a foot to two higher than an average tide throughout the year. And one to two and a half feet is about what we expect to see in California in increased sea level due to climate change over the next few decades. So photographing today's extreme high tides gives us a window into the everyday water level of the future. When you look at a beach or road that's flooded during king tides, think about what it would be like for the water level to be at least that high every day. You've had a lot of examples to look at today from our beautiful coastal state parks. So anyone with a smartphone or a digital camera can participate in this community science project. Just go to the website at california.kingtides.net where you can find out what time the King Tides will happen near you and how to upload your photos to the project. After you upload your photos using this simple form, we'll place them on a map of California that everyone can explore and learn from. And this shows you what uh, that map looks like. So we need photos from everywhere on the coast, on the bay and the Delta. When you take your photo for the King Tides project, try to include some sort of visual reference for how high the tide is. This is easiest if you look upshore or downshore rather than straight out at the water. So we can see a bluff or a seawall or some other relatively permanent object in the photo. Good King Tides photos can also show water under bridges or piers in relation to beach access stairs or flooding on streets and sidewalks. Try to take your photos as close to the peak high tide as possible. On the website, you can also check out photos from previous king tides and teachers and parents will find lots of educational resources to help your kids learn about king tides and climate change. So when you take your photos for the king tides project, you're helping planners, policymakers, and scientists understand how sea level rise is impacting our coast and how to plan for the future. 
And the king tides do something else that's really important. They give us a reason to talk about climate change with our family, our friends, and our neighbors. The more we talk about it, the more we all understand that we're part of a community that cares about climate change and wants to take action to protect the people and the places that we love. And lastly, I want to remind you again to give the ocean the respect it deserves. Always be aware of where you are in relation to waves, rocks, and bluff tops when you're at the shore. Don't ever risk your safety for the perfect king tides photo. Also, please wear your mask and keep your distance from those outside your household. So again, tomorrow, December 15th, is the last king tides day of this month but Northern and Central California will have one more series of King Tides on January 11th and 12th. And then we'll all wait until next winter for the next King Tides to arrive. So visit california.kingtides.net to get all the information you need to join us. I can't wait to see your King Tides photos. Thank you. Oh, that was great, Annie. Thank you so much. and. For all of you out there that are watching that do live locally near um, a coastline, we would love to see your project. But Annie mentioned very sage advice. Um, your safety is first. So please be careful if you are out there taking photos, never turn your back to the ocean. And of course, um, wear your mask if you are not able to maintain six feet of distance from, um, from others outside of your household. Now we have one more adventure. Um, going just a little bit farther up north. We're actually going to the farthest part of the state of California, our North Coast Redwoods District. And I believe I have a district manager, Marnin Robbins with me. And he has some special guests and also a really interesting way of glimpsing the effect of sea level rise and these King Tide events on both cultural and historical resources. So Marnin, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? Hey we there. sure can. Hi, take it away, Martin. Great to see you all and welcome to far northern California. I am standing on one of several islands in the middle of Humboldt Bay on a beautiful Monday morning here. And behind me is another one of those islands. And it is an incredibly special place. And I want to tell you a bit about that story today, bring you um, some insights into what makes that place so special. The island behind me is called Tulawat. It is the center of the Wiat people's cultural universe and the site of a ceremony that has taken place since time immemorial, uh, the World Renewal Ceremony. It is also the home of several village sites that date back thousands of years. Tulawat is a place of ancient culture, traditions. It's also a place of hope for the future. And one other thing, it is a place of immense tragedy. And we hope not a place of tragedy going into the future. This, the island itself is one of many cultural places across California that is endangered by rising seas from global climate change. Today, I would like to help uh, illuminate the story of this place by interviewing one of the people that knows this place best. And that is Cheryl Seidner, cultural leader, spiritual leader of the Wiat tribe and uh, their cultural director and liaison for, for um, their community to the world. Cheryl will be here um, telling you about the, the island, its place um, in their, their cultural pantheon. And we'll be discussing the future of this island given uh, impending impacts from sea level rise. I'll be stepping off camera in order to abide by social distancing and asking Cheryl some questions. So please welcome Dr. Cheryl Seidner. Hot, wet, lot, Greg, and good morning, everyone. This is Cheryl Seidner. I'm on Woodley Island, which is across from Tulawat. And now it's it has a new name, it's Tulawat Island, but I call it Tulawat. 
and <laughs> what what do you want from me? <laughs> Cheryl, it's so wonderful to be with you here today. Thank you for coming. Would you would you please tell our audience a bit about the island, about the island's history, um, going back to to ancient times and bringing us up to um, the events that unfolded um, 160 years ago. Every year, there's a ceremony on the island called World Renewal Ceremony, and it's to put the world right. We have all year to mess it up. And now we, we come together in the wintertime to start anew, to start afresh. And it's like the spring. And we're the first ceremony of the year for all the different tribes within the area. And we uh, come together, we sing songs, we commune with one another, and all are welcome. Not just the Wiat people, but the Hoopas and the Kurts and the Talawas and uh, the Yurok's. And we all come together to heal the world, to heal what has been going on this past year. And then we start anew, we start afresh. And we're now in 1860, unfortunately, there was a massacre that took all of our children and our, and our elders and our men were off the island at the time to give, bring back the next day supplies. And here we are singing, trying to make the world right. And people came across at night with clubs and hatchets and axe and, and killed as many people as they possibly could. And it was not the only place that the massacres took place. We were one of three places. One was Piemont at the entrance of Humboldt which is we call Wigi, and at the uh, entrance to the Eel River, which was called Weot back in the day. And now we have all this and we're trying to make it right today. And so we're still trying to heal the world. And in 2014, we did our first dance and our first ceremony. It was fabulous. Cheryl, could you tell us just a bit about your own connection to this island, your family's history here? My father's people came from uh, Eel River around Fernbridge. My mother's people came from Humboldt Bay and her great grandfather was the baby found on Indian Island back in uh, February 27th, 1860. So if it wasn't for that baby, we wouldn't be here today. And that's how close we are connected. And um, his mother was killed, but he was, he survived. Well, she fell over him or however it would be, but he was protected by her body. And the next day people came out and saw the buildings burning and, and saw the travesty that happened. And his father was gone, so he did have a father, but he was raised by other people. And here we are today. If it wasn't for that child, we wouldn't be here. We are so, um, so blessed that, that, that he was protected and that you're here with us today <laughs> to tell the story of this place. Yes, I, I, we started in 1992. There was a ship that was going to come into the bay called one of those Columbus ships. I can't remember what their names were. And uh, one of the replicas were coming into the bay and they were gonna celebrate it. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, I don't think so. We are going to remember all those who died, who were murdered on the island. And so we had our first candlelight vigil in 1992. And we only had about 70 people show up. By the last time we had around 200 to 300 people show up on one of those. And that was the last time we had a candlelight vigil because following, that was in February, the following March, we had our, our ceremony. And that was fabulous. Wonderful. 
Farrell, tell us just a bit about the most recent events that have occurred to help um, the, the Weah tribe restore the island from, from industrial use over the last hundred years and recent events to return the island once again to the Weah tribe. I, uh, I, I look at it as um, a blessing from the creator uh, to, to be bold to ask for things. And we uh, talked to the new mayor of Eureka and said, we want the island. And he said, let's talk. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so it, it took a few months and we got down and we sat down and talked to staff was talking to his staff and we got, first of all, we had to purchase 1.5 acres because it was under private ownership and we did. And we bought that and it was, um, we got, we raised enough money over a hundred, over 12 months. And we got it. Then afterwards we talked to the um, mayor we got the other island, I mean, the, the rest north of 255, which is the uh, highway going through the island. And we got all of that. And so we're doing that. And then just recently in 19, um, I mean, 2019, we got over 250 acres or the rest of what the city owned. And that was exciting and again we celebrated and so now we own the acreage on the island is 275 acres we own 90 percent of it that's wonderful and we had to clean it up because as you said it was industrial use there was a foundry that burned to the ground so all the chemicals leached into the ground before that there was uh, they made a seawall out of marine batteries about four feet high that was a travesty to me when I went out to see it. I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know what you've just done? So the director of the uh, natural resources for the Weyot tribe happened to overhear someone talking at a conference in San Francisco EPA and went in there and said, I wanna know more about how to get that super fun. And so we had cleaned it up by a lot of work, personal work. I was on the island, my sister, friends, nephews, Marnie, our director of the new center for the Weot tribe in Eureka, in Chorichichi. And so we um, got there and we got it done. And he got us the grant that pushed us over to get a clean bill of health in August of 2014, 2013. And so 2015, 2014, we got, we had our new ceremony. How wonderful. Oh, how wonderful. I can't explain how fabulous that felt the day that we started. On so the island. we actually have a photograph that I'd like to have Jen Langer share with our audience right now. A, a photograph of Cheryl on that day in 2014, um, returning from the island back to the city of Eureka, celebrating the, the return of the island back to, back to Weyot people again. In addition to that photograph, I wanna share two other photographs with our audience. And this is to start thinking about the future of this island. I'd like to share a photograph with you now, an aerial photograph of a portion of the island as it exists today. Um, the, the photograph here um, was taken just last year, and this is of what the island looks like at an average tide. Actually, the other one, Jen, if you don't mind, uh, seeing if it, it maybe got up in the front there. That looks right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's what the island looks like today. Now what I'd like to show you is the other photograph, the photograph as the island may look like 75 years from now. That photograph is from the year 2095, given 
six meters of sea level rise, six and a half feet, which is within the realm of possibilities given what scientists know about sea level rise. And as you can see, almost all of the island is gone. What I want to, to tell our audience is that this is, a, this is a future only of possibility. We don't know that that is the future that is coming. It is, it's up to us to decide whether that is the future that we'll inherit. So uh, Jan, go ahead and take the, take the picture off. And Cheryl, what I'd like to ask you is, now that we know what that future may look like given sea level rise and the, the hopes and the, the aspirations and determination of the Wea tribe to bring back the world renewal ceremony to the island, what can be done to ensure that this sacred place is protected into the future and that other cultural sites, we at cultural sites around Humboldt Bay are protected from future sea level rise? It is, um, it's gonna be hard work because it takes everybody. It doesn't take just one person, one tribe. It takes humanity, everyone. Uh, we need to deal with what's happening at the moment and try to prepare for what may come because in the Native American lore across the, not lore, but Native American philosophy across the United States is that we're, we look out for the seventh generation. And that's what we've got to do, seventh generation from today. We've got to look for those people. And to um, do that, we, we put up a seawall of our own that was corrugated fiberglass and, and we put it in the ground to stabilize where the burial sites were and, and from it washing away. And so that's protecting today. Protecting it for tomorrow is that we need to learn to be more green. We got to learn not to be using all the electricity during the daytime. If it's hot, work at night. <laughs> and, you know, it's in all those many things, we've got to fix it, try to put it in place for today. And we have a lot of um, things in, for, uh, uh, in planning. We have staff who is looking at the different ways of things. I, I, I was uh, thinking the other day, and then it was reconfirmed this morning about if there was not a massacre, our shaman would be higher, probably six meters higher. And, you know, we don't know. Those are just speculations. But when you, we all know that when we take things away, we realize that something now is missing and things come in that were not supposed to be here. And so we need to do our ceremonies because it doesn't heal just the we out world, it heals everybody. It heals the whole world. And we need to remember that water is our friend. It brings us nourishment. It brings us food. And we need to remember that we need to take care of it. And part of that is taking care of what we already have today and making things ready to what may happen tomorrow, but not to be caught unaware of what is in our future. So we look for right now, and we've got to remember the seventh generation, our great, 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 great grandchildren way out there, because they've got to know that we were thinking of them all the time. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. I'm gonna step back on camera here and just wanna thank you again and um, to express my gratitude for your work to bring the important stories of these places to people across the world. Well, just to let you know, you don't have to look at me, I can just <laughs> talk to you, is that um, we do this together. 
it's not was just one person. It was all of us, the staff, the community, people like yourself. It takes all of us to make it right. And um, let's be green together. Folks, there are thousands of cultural sites across California that are endangered by sea level rise. But it's up to us to make sure that those sites and other places that we value are, are protected into the future. And we can do that in lots of ways. One way is to identify those sites and protect them um, physically um, from approaching sea level rise. But we also all have a moral obligation to take actions today to ensure that the worst impacts of sea level rise don't happen. And that's by not burning all of the oil, natural gas and coal that currently exists in the ground to find other uh, ways of, of powering our future. So thanks again for listening in and um, I will turn it back over to Aaron. Thanks again. Morning, cool. thank you very much. And Cheryl, um, we just want to make sure that we extend our gratitude to you as well. That was an incredibly powerful um, component of the broadcast. There's a lot of people on Facebook that are commenting. They're saying thank you. They're saying that was very inspiring. And one of your comments, I just felt bared repeating where you said it takes everyone, it takes humanity to make it right and we need to look out for the seventh generation. So thank you so much, Cheryl, for being a part of this broadcast with us. And without further ado, uh, we have additional special guests beyond Cheryl, uh, beyond Annie with the California Coastal Commission. We have uh, two very special guests that we are honored to have joining us. And the first is our director of California State Parks, uh, Director Quintero. Did, director Quintero, are you with us today? You know, good morning, Aaron. I am. The secretary needs to go before me. He just had something come up and he's ready to go. So if we could switch Perfect. to him. And after. Thanks. You've got it. Thank you. Okay. Secretary Crowfoot um, of our Natural Resources Agency, are you with us? Hey, well, thanks so much. I've uh, just had a chance to, to join for the last 15 minutes and I have to uh, thank uh, both uh, Marnin uh, and uh, Dr. Seidner, Cheryl, um, that is an incredibly powerful story uh, in the Humboldt Bay, uh, both um, what we need to do um, to really redress uh, our own state history uh, with tribal communities and um, recognizing that our state was, was founded uh, on a policy of cultural genocide that we um, every day uh, need to take action to redress. Um, and then also just the tremendous potential of partnerships um, with our tribal communities and our tribal leaders. Uh, as uh, I've been educated, you know, our tribal communities have been stewarding our lands, including our state park lands since time immemorial, and we have so much to learn. And of course, um, the powerful example of that island uh, and how it's threatened by climate change. Um, so I just want to thank you both uh, up on the North Coast and frankly, uh, everyone who's been able to present today. We obviously face uh, tremendous unprecedented challenges uh, given climate change in our state. And I think uh, clearly, you know, most of the state is most sensitized to how climate change is worsening our catastrophic wildfire threats. Uh, and just a few years ago, it was, of course, uh, the epic drought. Uh, and the impact of climate change on worsening droughts uh, that had our attention. In 2017, it was the uh, Oroville Dam, the potential failure of the Oroville Dam as a result of, of flooding. Um, and of course, if you work or live along the coast, um, you are increasingly aware of how sea level rise uh, impacts us. So I would say this, which is we in Sacramento are focused on helping you uh, tell the story to Californian visitors, residents who come to our state parks to really help them understand why climate action is so imperative uh, and what uh, and how uh, climate, act, climate change is already impacting uh, California. 
And I'll say among those threats, wildfire, drought, flooding, sometimes uh, sea level rise can feel like the most conceptual threat uh, to many that don't live the day-to-day -day lives uh, that you do in your work uh, or in your communities on the coast. And for many, it seems, well, what's the big deal? Uh, you know, a foot or four feet of, of sea level rise. You know, when they think about a place like Big Sur um, with uh, 100 foot cliffs, it doesn't seem like um, it's a major, there's major impact. And I think that's where the King Tides project comes in. Um, you all have an, an opportunity multiple times each year to, to identify, to demonstrate uh, how sea level rise will impact our communities. I lived in San Francisco for almost 20 years, and I was blown away walking along the Embarcadero uh, for the first King Tide event that I experienced. And there's no substitute, actually, for feeling the water at your ankles um, on a sidewalk that's typically uh, several feet uh, above the water. So I think it's a, a great both, uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity, really, uh, for state parks to continue to lead uh, on its scientific interpretation uh, by educating California uh, about the, the role of king tides. And frankly, for those of you not from state parks who are watching today as uh, community leaders or residents uh, on the coast, we ask for your participation uh, as well. So I'm excited uh, with the work that you all continue to do at state parks, um, both telling the important uh, historical uh, and cultural stories uh, that we heard of just now from um, Martin and Cheryl, uh, but then also interpreting um, the science of California and specifically the challenges of climate change. I'm really glad to have as a partner in this work uh, Armando Quintero, our new State Parks Director. Armando brings a career um, both stewarding our parks and ensuring that our cultural and scientific interpretations at our parks is accurate and forward-looking and he brings tremendous passion to supporting your work uh, actually out there in the field and in coastal communities, uh, both educating on the challenge of sea level rise and taking action uh, to build our resilience uh, to this impact. So without further ado, Armando, I'd love to turn it over to you. Aaron, am I going, am I live? You are live, Director Quintero from China. Camp State Park. Thank you. Take it away. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Secretary Crowfoot. And I just have to say it is just an unbelievable honor to be working with state parks and the people of state parks. Um, I'm actually uh, broadcasting from China Camp State Park. And this is a park which is actually operated by a nonprofit friends group called the Friends of China Camp. And they really do an amazing job here. And where I'm standing is in the heart of a 150 year old fishing village which is on the shore of San Francisco Bay. Um, as you can see behind me, uh, as, these, as this king tide is rising, these tides now touch the historic structures here on China Camp. And there's one structure that is to the south of me, which is actually um, you know, fairly inundated by the high tides when they occur during these king tide events. Um, to the north of me, there are a number of salt marshes uh, which during the King Tide events are completely inundated. And when that happens, the wildlife that finds shelter within the vegetation of the salt marsh actually get pushed up to the surface. And so birds that you normally don't see that are protected by the vegetation are actually pushed to the surface and become susceptible to predators and other impacts uh, by virtue of these tides. You know, state parks provide an incredible set of connections to the human stories and the natural histories uh, stories of California. Certainly the human stories go beyond 12,000 years from the present. But one of the things that I think is just astonishing about these places is not only do they provide a glimpse and an understanding of the past, we actually get to experience these places in real time. And what we're seeing today is these parks actually allow us a view of the future. And having that view of the future really puts us in a position to act and to make decisions that can make a difference, not only to protect these places, but to protect the very people and the places where we live. Just a few miles from me, just to the south and to the west, there are entire communities. There's a town called San Rafael. And to drive here, I actually drove past um, a number of houses that were literally 
just a few feet above where the sea level is now or where the king tides are rising now. So these, uh, these changes are real threats to the world as we know it. Uh, one of the things that I also want to take a moment to acknowledge is I want to express my sincere and heartfelt thanks to the professional storytellers of state parks. We refer to them as interpreters, but they really are an astonishing assemblage of skilled individuals with backgrounds in history, natural history, and a number of areas that really make the telling of stories come to life for visitors who are both visiting the parks and in this time of COVID visitors who like you are watching and visiting these places virtually. And we really do look forward to seeing you in these parks. And also with the governor's shelter in place order, one of the things that we're encouraging the public to do is to come to places, come to state parks and enjoy them, practice social distancing, make sure you're wearing a mask. I took mine off just for this event and there's no one within sight of me right now. Um, but get out there and get your physical exercise, get a mental break. And also with your social bubbles, enjoy that social well-being that we get from being with each other. Um, I'd also like to thank the guests who we had on, the folks from the Coastal Commission, the member of the tribe up on the North Coast. You know, it's, it's really, we're looking at a world where we all have to participate, we all have to cooperate. And it's for the betterment, not only for ourselves and our communities, but also certainly for our children. Um, I'd also like to mention that on October 20th of this year, Governor Newsom signed an executive order launching innovative strategies to use California land to fight climate change, to conserve biodiversity, and to boost climate resilience. Um, within that directive, we actually have a wetlands restoration to protect coastal areas project. And this actually sets a first in the nation goal to conserve 30% of the state's land and coastal waters by 2030, specifically for the purpose of fighting species loss and ecosystem destruction. And you know, it's not just about ecosystems and species loss. Those are the systems on which we all depend. So this really is a critical and urgent message for all of us to see these places and to visualize and understand what's going on in the world around us. You know, there's almost 130 coastal parks uh, within the state park system, and it covers about 340 miles of the state coastline. And um, within these coastal parks, there's bar built estuaries. Um, there's over 50 million people that visit these state beaches and other coastal areas annually. And we are really focused at state parks um, on putting together, and we actually, we have a, a draft sea level rise program for all of these parks, which is gonna be coming out this year. And we are really excited to be able to put something out there to the public and to the uh, teams that operate state parks to really make a difference in challenging ourselves and challenging each other to make a dis difference going forward. And again, I, my sincere thank to the team that put this event together. It makes a difference for us. It makes a difference for the world. Thank you so much, Director Quintero. And thank you to Secretary Crow for giving us um, a moment of your time and, and sharing uh, with us and also for guiding all of us, both Californians and California State Park employees, as we all come together to work towards protecting our cultural, natural, and historical resources, um, which is... California State Parks. So thank you so much again. And we could hear the water continue to come up. I believe it is the highest of the high right now at China Camp. So um, seven, feet. seven feet will stay dry. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer Langer. We have had a lot of things going on while everyone's been talking. We had a wave breach the seawall down at Van Damme State Beach. So we might give you a quick visual of uh, what's going on around the state. And Jen, take it away. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of, Steve, are we able to give a visual of that right now? Uh, you know, not really. Actually, it, it, it was a it was a fluke. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I did have to retreat into the parking lot, um, but I'm back into um, my spot with good reception. <laughs> But no worries. No worries. They Thank had me nervous there for a second. 
Well, I just I just want to conclude with, uh, you know, again, thanking all of the California State Park interpreters um, that came forward to be a part of this event today, to highlight your parks, to use Keen Tides as an opportunity for our, our viewers, our audience uh, to view, to, to visualize what the future of, of sea level rise looks like. Um, this has been an incredible lineup. This is our fourth annual live streaming event. I believe we'll be back again next year. And I just, I'm so pleased with the special guests that we're, we were able to um, incorporate into this from, from Secretary Crowfoot to Director Quintero to Annie from the uh, California Coastal Commission. And of course, Cheryl um, from the WEOC community. What, what an incredible um, segment that was. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us that cultural perspective and those stories that, that, that just mean so much for us to highlight in, in addition to all of the other physical impacts that um, the, the sea level rise uh, will have on, on our coastline. This has just been a phenomenal get together. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who joined us um, on the webinar, on Facebook Live, for, for leaving your comments, your questions, and we got a lot of love coming in too. For this event. So um, if Erica or Aaron, you want to, yeah, lots of love. Um, if you want to um, come in and just conclude with any comments you may have, um, that would be great. But guys, give a big wave to our virtual audience because you were the ones that brought this and made it what it was. So thank you so much. Aaron, Erica, any last minute comments? Just thank you for watching. Please share with your friends. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to all of the students and the young learners that tuned in to watch today to learn about our King Tides and also about sea level rise. So thank you guys for your participation, for sharing so many really well thought questions, both in the webinar and on Facebook. It was really fun interacting with you. And yeah, like Aaron said, if you know someone who'd like to learn about King Tides or sea level rise and the future of the California coast, please share this video with them. We will have the recording archived on California State Parks uh, Facebook page, but also with Ports Program. Jen introduced Ports Program back at the beginning of the program. We are the Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students, and we'll have a recording of this program today archived on our YouTube and our website. So feel free to share. Thank you, That's guys. Great. And don't forget to participate in the Snap the Shore, See the Future community project and stay safe and have fun while you're out there. And we'll see you again, inevitably, next year for our annual King Tides. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs>